but it's 12.15, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation by Erica Franz, Associate Professor of Political Science at Michigan State University, who will speak to us today on how, democracy, how today's democracies fall apart. I am Megan Phillips, a co-director of ICFRC and host for today's program. We would like to take a moment to thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible. Um, I would also like to acknowledge our university and community sponsors, um, the UI International Programs, the UI Honors Program, UI Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. I also thank City Channel 4 for helping us continue to make our programs viewable to an online audience. Um, so following our speaker's presentation at about 1 p.m., we will have a 15-minute Q&A during which you can submit your questions via the chat function on Zoom or by leaving a comment on the Facebook Live video. So it is my pleasure to introduce Erica, Fran to introduce Erica France, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science at Michigan State University. From 2011 to 2015, she was an Assistant Professor in Political Science at Bridgewater State University. And from 2008 to 2011, she worked as an analyst at the Institute for Physical Sciences. She specializes in authoritarian politics, democratization, conflict, and development. She has published seven books on dictatorships and development, including Authoritarianism, What Everyone Needs to Know. Please join me today in welcoming Erica France. And with that, I will leave it to you, Erica, to go ahead and screen share whatever you'd like to. Great. Uh, it says it's disabled, so maybe okay. you can click Let's a little. Fix that really quick. And there you go, you should be able to. Great, okay. Thank you so much for uh, having me. Let me see if I can get my, uh, there we go. Okay, thanks so much for having me. Um, I have been giving a talk on these themes for the last couple of years. And the major messages, if anything, have uh, grown stronger. So as Megan mentioned, I study authoritarian politics and development, which means that I usually speak about countries that are in the developing world um, and countries that are dictatorships. So I'm not, um, I'm not used to speaking about the United States and you'll see that I don't mention the United States in this talk, but it'll be fairly clear uh, as the talk progresses, a lot of the parallels that, um, that there are a lot of parallels between uh, political developments in the U.S. and what we've been seeing ha happening around the world, and I'm happy to speak about those in the Q&A. Okay, so uh, to start things off, I wanted to give you some good news <laughs> because pretty much the rest of the talk is going to be bad news um, about the state of uh, democracy. So here I have a map of the world, and the countries that are in blue are considered democracies, and this is uh, based on Freedom House ratings. So blue countries are democratic, gray countries are not. And one of the nice messages that appears here is that much of the world is in blue. So today, a majority of the world's countries are democratic, which is a nice development, particularly since um, the end of the Cold War, where we saw the collapse of the Soviet Union and its satellite states and this wave of democratization, which has uh, continued. So we don't often spend time thinking about democratizations happening today, but they are uh, occasionally occurring in places such as uh, Malaysia, to give a recent example. That said, there's quite a bit of bad news. I'm sure if you've paid much attention to the news, <laughs> you've heard a lot about uh, the challenges that today's democracies are facing and also just declines in freedom more generally. This also comes from Freedom House, and it plots out those countries that have experienced improvements in freedom, and then those that have experienced declines. And so the pink there, the declines. And Freedom House is an organization that has spent quite a bit of time uh, sounding the alarm bell that there have been global declines in freedom. And in fact, they have counted 14 consecutive years with declines in freedom. Now, in some instances, these declines have happened in places that are still democratic. Um, examples would be India and Poland. So they've just seen a deterioration in the quality of their democracies. But in a number of places, we've seen these declines be so serious that they have 
pushed those, those democracies into authoritarianism. And that is going to be the subject that I talk about today. So when does democratic decline lead to democratic collapse? Here I have an image from Turkey of Erdogan voting in the polls there. And the Turkish experience is very much emblematic of global trends, where we have a leader like Erdogan who is elected in a free and fair election. So when he came to power, by most observer's standards, uh, Turkey was a democracy. And then as Erdogan's power passed, uh, he started to do a number of actions that raised questions about you know, his commitment to democracy. And indeed, today, most observers could consider Turkey to be authoritarian. So his actions accumulated to this situation where we no longer consider Turkey to be democratic. I put the transition at 2016, but other people might um, differ. This process I refer to as authoritarianization, and that is kind of a clunky term for um, an incumbent-led takeover. So an authoritarianization occurs when a democratically elected leader pushes a country towards dictatorship. So I'm going to talk about these authoritarianizations today. Now, um, as a summary of the major messages, today's demo democracies are increasingly falling apart from within through this process of authoritarianization. And second, uh, this is leading to a rise in strongman rule, which I'm going to show you is the most dangerous form of dictatorship. So two major themes here. We're seeing a change in how democracy is falling apart today, and also that these new dictatorships that are forming are, um, tend to be personalist, and that this is troublesome for global peace and prosperity. Okay, I'm going to go through the two major types of democratic collapse. The first are coerced transitions. And this is what we typically think about when you hear that a democracy fell or that an, a new uh, dictatorship was born. We often think that it happens through, that it was coerced. And these coerced collapses uh, usually happen through coups, but they can also occur foreign powers coming in or rebellions. And this is an example from Brazil in 1964, where the military troops hit the streets of Brazil, overthrew the democratic government, and installed a military dictatorship. Okay, so one big category would be these forced, uh, coerced transitions. But democracies can also collapse without the use of force, through this process called authoritarianization that I was alluding to. Okay, I'm going to give you two examples of these different types of transitions to highlight the specific ways in which they differ. So let's start with Chile. Uh, its democracy collapsed in 1973 when we had Chilean troops stage a coup and oust Salvador Allende, who had been elected in free and fair uh, contest. Uh, the military stormed the presidential palace. It attacked until Allende eventually took his own life. Augusto Pinochet came to power along with a military junta and governed until 1989. Okay, so here, if you were to try to identify the date that Chilean democracy fell apart, it's really easy. September 11th, 1973, it's the date of the coup. Okay, so this is the classic way that democracies uh, have now contrast that with the example of Venezuela. So Hugo Chavez won free and fair elections in 1998. And Venezuela is in the news a lot today because of the horrific uh, conditions that ordinary citizens are experiencing. We often forget that for many decades prior to this, Venezuela was kind of this like poster child for our democracy in Latin America and had been robust to some of the authoritarian interludes that other Latin American countries had experienced. So Chavez came to power in a democratic contest in 1998. However, trouble was on the horizon. And there are a number of things that he did that were problematic. I'm going to highlight a few. He expanded the size of the Supreme Court, and allowed judges to be dismissed by majority vote, thereby weakening the, the uh, judiciary. 
he also started to stack the Supreme Court with his loyalists. So suddenly Chavistas are filling all of these big judicial positions of power and people who opposed him were purged. He published a list of individuals who had signed a recall petition. Um, so they had put out this effort to try to recall Chavez. Those people who had signed the petition were publicized and many lost their uh, public employment as well as welfare benefits. He passed laws constraining media reporting, limiting the media's ability to constrain him. And he also started using really loaded rhetoric uh, when it came to his opponents. Suddenly, if you were not a fan of Chavez, it wasn't a political position. It was almost like you were questioning the viability of the state. So suddenly you are an anti-revolutionary if you don't support Chavez. All of this was troubling. Uh, but the precise date that Venezuela's democracy fell apart could be debated. In my view, it was in 2005 when there was this election where the opposition basically boycotted. They put these fingerprint machines at the polls so that they could tell who had voted for who. So this was very concerning to many opponents of Chavez, so they just didn't show up. But other observers could easily identify a different moment that Venezuela's democracy collapsed. Today, there's this clear consensus that Venezuela is not a democracy, but identifying the precise moment of the transition is pretty difficult. It turns out that these authoritarianizations are on the rise. So here I have some data for you uh, that show how democracies fell apart from 19 46 to 2010. So those blue bars are going to be the uh, full sample period. So this is like about 60 years or so post World War II. And you can see that coups made up the majority of democratic collapses. At least 60% of democracies fell apart through coup in that full period. But when we zoom in to the 2000 to 2010 period, we see a different picture emerged where authoritarianisms are authoritarianizations rather are starting to rival coups. I am currently in the process of updating the data and I've gotten through 2019. I don't have it here for you, but the message is that authoritarianizations now outnumber coups. Uh, recent examples include Hungary, Turkey, Bangladesh, and Nicaragua. So this is a fairly dramatic change in the dynamics of uh, democratic collapse. And I'm going to show you uh, the reasons why it's pretty consequential shortly. Things off, how are authoritarianizations different? So that comparison between Chile and Venezuela kind of brings to the fore some of the ways that they're different, but I'm going to zoom in here. So for one, authoritarianizations are a lot less risky than coups, and they're easier to execute. Now, what do I mean by risky? Well, it turns out that half of all coup attempts fail. If you were a coup plotter and your coup attempt fails, you are likely to be punished for that action. So coups are actually very risky endeavors. They also require a lot of coordination and careful planning. And there are a lot of areas where things can go wrong. An authoritarianization, by contrast, is simply the incumbent um, leveraging his access or her access or, um, to consolidate control. So that gets to the second point here and that an authoritarianization is an incumbent seizing control as opposed to an outsider doing so. This means that these um, would-be autocrats, these democratically elected leaders that are trying to gain control, they have access to a lot of resources at their disposal because they are uh, the executive of the state. So they can leverage that access to uh, pursue agenda. The other big difference that I've been trying to uh, get at is that these, these processes are slow and incremental. Why does that matter? Well, it is much easier for opponents to push back against uh, a coup attempt than it is for them to push back against one single action that seems fishy. So the international community, for example, often rallies in support of democracy when there is a coup attempt and tries to pressure the coup leadership to step out of power. 
within, th within authoritarianization, because this is the accumulation of a number of um, anti-democratic events, it's much more difficult to, to um, launch a successful campaign for democracy. Okay, there are, having, having analyzed a number of authoritarianizations, there are a number of key messages that come to the surface over and over again. And by this, I mean that these leaders who are pursuing this type of um, agenda often emphasize a number of themes. The first is that elites are corrupt. We see this over and over again. And the would-be autocrat here identifies the current establishment as corrupt, untrustworthy, this means that their leadership is needed to fix some of these issues. Uh, relatedly, experts can't be trusted. Experts also are threatening to these would-be autocrats, and so they try to diminish their value by saying that you can't trust this. You can't trust scientists, you can't trust academics, they have their own agendas, and so on. We also often see this message that traditional institutions don't work. So, you know, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, nothing is working as it should. Um, you know, that you need a strong leader to come in to this issue. Um, and then related to that point, that citizens really need some sort of strong leadership to fix all of these ails and ailments that the uh, country is experiencing. So these are some typical messages that uh, would-be autocrats use um when they are undergoing this uh process now this rhetoric is accompanied by some specific actions and we see these actions occurring across a number of institutional domains so the first you could also think of these as red flags <laughs> that democracy is in trouble so the first red flag here is that the leader places loyalists in high positions now you can put your family members or, or other loyalists in certain positions and it's not quite as troubling. Where I see things as particularly troubling is when these loyalists are in key positions in the judiciary and the security services. The judiciary matters because that is a key institution that can provide a check on the executive and then the security services matter because they have weapons and uh, their support is needed to push through with some of these agendas. Another red flag would be treatment of the media. So censorship uh, to buy the media or sideline it. When we see critical journalists arrested, that's not a good thing. Um, sometimes this can happen in two different ways. Sometimes the government tries to, to uh, control the media by purchasing it. Other times they try to censor the media or seek out additional uh, media avenues or ways of communicating to the public. And then another trouble area is when we see lawsuit, lawsuits and legislation that is intended to marginalize civil society or other opponents to the government. A good example of this would be from Russia, where Putin pushed for legislation that branded foreign non-governmental organizations, foreign NGOs, as uh, problematic and um, they it made it so that it was difficult for them to operate in Russia. We see this type of thing um, in many other countries as well, where lawsuits are very targeted um, and basically veiled attempts to punish opponents. Okay, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of recent experiences with authoritarianization that we've seen. So one comes from Nicaragua under Daniel Ortega. Now, he came to power in 2006 and Nicaragua had been democratic since about 1990. So that's not a huge period of democracy, but it's pretty sizable. Now, um, developments in recent years have been troubling. So there was a court ruling that ousted the leader of the main opposition party, that is not good. There were 16 opposition lawmakers who were expelled from the National Assembly. The uh, Constitution was also amended in 2014, giving Ortega a three term, a third term in 2016. And 
I mentioned loyalists. While his wife, sons, and daughters were appointed to key positions of power, his wife is the vice president. Now, nothing against her own credentials, okay? Um, it's possible that she has the credentials to be vice president, but in this instance, that is not justified. And instead, we see this as more of a nepotistic act to ensure that his people who agree with him are in powerful positions. Okay, I put the demise of Venezuelan democracy, or sorry, Nicaraguan democracy as 2016, when they had a, an election that uh, was not up to international standards. But you could disagree about when it actually occurred. The next example comes from Hungary. So Orban has done a number of troubling things. I'm going to list a, a handful of examples here. The lead newspaper closed after it revealed a scandal of Fidesz, his uh, ruling cult party. They also pushed for electoral rule changes. Now, this seems like, why, why shouldn't you be able to push for electoral rule changes? Well, these rule changes were specifically designed to ensure that the ruling coalition got greater representation. That's not good. The government also had far more access to the media than opponents did. And then I put the demise of uh, democracy in Hungary at 2018. This is debatable. This is uh, the year that we had parliamentary elections happen there, which were criticized by a number of monitoring organizations. Regardless, you see this common theme here that there are these individual steps that accumulate to a troubling situation and eventually the collapse of democracy. There are a number of places that I could highlight as next up in terms of <laughs> where we might see authoritarianization down the road. Um, Philippines under Duterte comes to mind. This is really, the, the democracy there is really kind of um, hanging on by a thread, I think you could say. So Duterte has pushed for sedition cases against some of his opponents. Journalists are frequently attacked. In fact, it turns out that being a journalist in the Philippines is one of the most dangerous places in the world to practice journalism. So that is troubling. Duterte has also pursued this drug crackdown that has been very much alarming in terms of human rights. We've seen a number of extrajudicial killings. So this is definitely a hot spot where we might see authoritarianization occur down the road. I still see the Philippines as democratic because the elections so far have been free and fair, but it is definitely... Um, on the fringe there. Oh, and I forgot to mention, he's also, there's also been assassinations of civil society activists. Not good. Okay. Now, I pointed out some of the broad ways that, that authoritarianizations are occurring and showed you that this mode of democratic transition is increasing um, and that this is now the typical way that today's democracies are falling apart. I mentioned at the start of this talk that this is troubling because it is giving way to a dangerous form of dictatorship. So there are a variety of different types of dictatorship. Um, and one type of dictatorship is a personal dictatorship where power is concentrated in the hands of the leader. And here's Erdogan. I classify Turkey under Erdogan as a personal dictatorship. It turns out that authoritarianizations are increasingly leading or serving as a springboard into personalist rule. So 44% of authoritarianizations led to personalist rule from 1946 to 1999. Compare this to 75% that have occurred from 2000 to 2010. And indeed, if we were to include Turkey's Erdogan in the sample and extend the years past 2010, that would be another example of personal rule. The same would be said uh, with Nicaragua and so on. So this, this specific mode of democratic collapse is really increasingly serving as a uh, starting point for personal dictatorship. Now, you could kind of intuit why, right? So I mentioned all of these messages that these would-be autocrats are uh, putting out there to consolidate control. 
Things like you need a strong leader. Well, that's obviously something that um, comes with personalist rule, but also the sidelining of traditional institutions. In some dictatorships, power is more collegial and dispersed, uh, meaning that the power structure kind of works with these existing institutions. With these authoritarianizations and this message that you can't trust existing institutions, you, re you really see a hollowing out of the types of institutions that could constrain the leader in a dictatorship. So I could get into more reasons why, but the basic framework is there that the precise strategies and messaging that these uh, leaders are using really facilitates a transition to personal um, dictatorship. Now you might think, well, why does that matter? <laughs> Who cares if we see personalist dictatorships? Okay, unfortunately, it is very consequential. So there is a wide body of literature dedicated to the types of outcomes we see based on the type of dictatorship. And if we just look at dictatorships and compare them by type, uh, personalist dictators are associated with a laundry list of negative outcomes. And here I have two classic personalist dictators, Idi Amin of Uganda and then Gaddafi of Libya. So why are personalist dictators bad? Well, research shows that among dictatorships, they are more likely to start wars. They are more likely to escalate military disputes and ratchet things up. They are more likely to make foreign policy mistakes that can be consequential. They are also more likely to hold on to power until the very end. And in fact, their departures from power are often very bloody and violent. Qaddafi's exit very much exemplifies that dynamic. They are also least likely to democratize. So when personalist dictatorships collapse, we often see a new dictatorship emerge uh, afterwards. Okay, I could list additional domains in which personalist rule is negative for global peace and prosperity. I'll save it. Um, and I can also, if you would like, later get into some of the reasons why personalist dictatorship is so uh, harmful. A lot of it has to do with the absence of constraints on the leadership. And uh, it turns out that the ability to act as you please is actually not a good thing <laughs> for um, peace and prosperity. Okay, so there are a number of telltale signs of personalism, if you are curious, that I'm going to, just to give you a sense of what I mean by personalist rule. The first is the use of a referendum or plebiscite as a way of making decisions. And this is an image here from Nazi Germany. So uh, early on, Hitler put out a referendum to to put it to voters whether they wanted to enhance his power and merge a number of positions into one. And this is a, a banner that I believe says something like, yes to the Fuhrer. Surprise, surprise, Hitler won the referendum vote <laughs> and most observers saw his power as greatly enhanced as a consequence. We've also seen referendum votes in Turkey at, as a more recent example. And this is a way of sidelining the traditional legislative institutions and putting things to the people, then using fraud to put a stamp on uh, the leader's policy proposal. Another key indicator of personalism is the installation of loyalists in key positions of power. Uh, uh, Ortega under Nicaragua exemplifies this. His wife is the vice president. We see this in a number of instances. Saddam Hussein's Iraq is a great example of this where Many individuals who were either closely uh, tied to Hussein or family members had positions that they were definitely not qualified for. And relatedly, the promotion of family members to powerful posts. In this instance, what these leaders are doing is prioritizing loyalty or competence. So they'd rather be around people who they can trust than people who are competent because they view these competent individuals as a threat to their control. Uh, another indicator of personalism is the creation of a new political party or movement. The experience of Venezuela exemplifies this one where Chavez established this Chavista movement. Um, and, and it's this new revolutionary agenda. That is another example of personalism because rather than attaching themselves to an existing uh, party or traditional party, 
that has its own set of rules and guidelines, these leaders are sidelining the traditional political establishment again and creating these new movements that are often indistinguishable from the leader uh, himself. And I keep saying himself because the vast majority of dictators have been male with the exception perhaps of Bangladesh. Okay, I mentioned that we're seeing rise in nationalism. This is just some basic data to exemplify this. Uh, so this has the number of dictatorships worldwide since World War II or so, up until 2010. And that solid line are party-based dictatorships, which were very abundant during the Cold War due to geopolitics, um, the prestige of the Soviet Union, and so forth. But let's look at that personal category, which is hyphenated there. And you can see that personless regimes have increased in number over time. And if we were to extend this past 2010, that number would just keep rising. So personless dictatorships are increasingly making up a larger percentage of the world's dictatorships. All right, you might be wondering, why do leaders get away with this? What's going on here? And I'm going to highlight a couple of things. The first is that as these leaders are doing these strategies that observers see as troubling and undemocratic, their supporters are either unwilling or unable to push back. I try to repeat this over and over again when I talk about these themes because we often look to the opposition to do something about these power grabs. But it's not, it's not the opposition's uh, responsibility to do something. It really lies within the leader's support group and within the, the supporters of the leader's party. And that is because those are the only individuals who often have the uh, power to actually push back. So what we see happening is that in many instances, supporters don't want to. So here I have an image from Venezuela where this man is at the, a country club in Caracas where the membership costs, I think, something like 400 times more than the typical Venezuelan salary. He is doing well under the status quo and has little incentive to use his economic influence to do anything about the power grab that uh, occurred there. In other instances, supporters are unable to push back. And this can be because the party that supports the leader is often just a personal field. Uh-oh, it looks like Erica is frozen. We'll give her a second to uh, hopefully be able to come back. She did mention that she has been having internet issues this morning, which I know all of us in Iowa can appreciate the gravity of internet problems and electricity going out. <laughs> Hopefully she can get back on, let's see. Tanner, do you by chance have a phone number for her? I do not, but I can email her real quick and oh. see. Oh, okay. pop back on for a second. Sorry everyone for the interruption. Usually it does take a minute, but usually people can get back on, so we'll just give her a minute. 
I think I'm back. Yes, after. you are. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm sorry about that. And then for a while, I was wondering how long I had been talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm not I, sure how long you were talking, but. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm just going to jump back right where I was, and hopefully that's okay. Yep, sounds um, good. Let's see here. Okay. This should work, and we can get going. Okay, so uh, before my Zoom had some issues, opponents lack this big event that could effectively get them mobilized and hit the streets. A recent example of this from an autocracy would be Belarus, where uh, Lukashenko has done some terrible things for a long time. But more recently, there was this big triggering event, which was the overt fraudulence that happened at the time of that election. Okay. The other question that might be on your minds is why now? Now this part is going to be conjecture. We simply don't know with certainty why now, but I can point to a couple of reasons that are at the top of my head in terms of why. And the first has to do with this consensus since the end of the Cold War, war that democracy has won out. So citizens support the democratic model, and we know this through extensive survey evidence that most citizens around the globe would rather have democracy than autocracy. Okay, so there's this global uh, support for democracy as well as international rewards for having seemingly democratic institutions. So you're more likely to get foreign aid if you hold multi-party elections, as an example. This means that it's no longer as um, enticing to establish a dictatorship through a coup as it is through this process of authoritarianization where you're basically pretending that you are governing a, a democracy while pursuing undemocratic moves. So on the one hand, from the leader's perspective, there are good, good incentives to do this slow approach as opposed to something that's more obviously undemocratic. And then from the perspectives of citizens, even though citizens want democracy, they are also increasingly frustrated that their democratic governments are not delivering. And we see this via perceptions that citizens are losing out economically. And I say perceptions because it's not necessarily, what matters is not necessarily whether you are doing, doing poorly economically, but rather that you perceive that you're doing poorly. And the um, image here is from Hungary, where there are rural voters who engage in this big protest in support of Orban. Okay, so they're protesting to support him. And in this instance, one of the major messages that they were uh, in line with was his anti-immigrant stance. This is in conjunction with evidence that citizens in a number of countries are fearful of globalization and the uh, political dynamics that it has set in motion, that they're fear fearful of losing out to uh, immigrants and to refugees and so forth. Then likewise, we're also seeing frustration among citizens that the establishment is corrupt and inept. So these frustrations can accumulate to a situation where citizens want you know, somebody strong to take over and fix these problems, even if that person who does this act is also corrupt and inept. Uh, regardless, you know, things are often gray in the political world. They don't always see these things. And so we see some acceptance for uh, authoritarianizations. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize here the major points that I made. And that is that today's democracies are increasingly falling apart from within via authoritarianization, and also that this is leading to a rise in strongman rule, which is the most dangerous form of dictatorship. The, uh, I don't know, hopeful message <laughs> that I would like to put out is that the first step towards reversing this sort of trend is actually identifying what's happening, how, and what, why it matters. So now that we know that authoritarianizations are kind of the new norm in terms of democratic collapse, we have better tools for assessing how dangerous it is when we see some of these red flag activities uh, take place. So I'm gonna wrap it up there and I look forward to any questions that you might have.
Okay, awesome. Um, I will turn this on. Let me just pull up my outline here. Okay, so yes, now we will move into the Q&A. So um, please put your questions in the chat function and we will, I will go ahead, if it works for you, Erica, I will go ahead and read those out loud um, for the benefit of people calling in and then turn it over to you to answer. Um, but while we take a minute to give people a, question, a minute to think about questions, um, I would like to just remind everyone about our upcoming programs. So next week on Wednesday, October 7th, we have Craig Just, who is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at UIowa. And he is gonna be speaking on community-based drinking water improvements in Nicaragua. And then, the week after that, on October the 15th, we have Chad Hart from Iowa State. Um, he's spoken to us before. He is going to be speaking on COVID-19 and global agriculture. So with that, I will go to questions. Um, and it looks like we already have a few in there. Perfect. All right, so uh, first question from Peter asking, is Rwanda a rather special case? So Rwanda is a special case in that some would consider it a benevolent dictatorship. Um, I and most observers classify Rwanda as authoritarian. We've had Kagame in power since 1994 uh, with the same party backing him. But Rwanda has kind of been seen as this darling in the development community because it has done a lot to improve the quality of life of its citizens, including things like banning, I believe they banned plastic bags. So uh, they've done a lot of innovations that many developing co developed countries have not been able to pursue. That said, from you know, a human rights perspective, citizens still don't have the ability to select their leadership in, in a free and fair way. And if you're an opponent to Kagame, that is not good. Yes, definitely a special case. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jeannie is asking, do you see the United States on track away from democracy and toward dictatorship? I have been asked that question many, many times <laughs> in, uh, in the past, uh, since 2016. Um, so there are a number of um, developments in the United States that have been troubling for observers of uh, American politics but also from a comparative perspective. So we have a variety of surveys in the authoritarian policy and the overwhelming consensus is that American democracy has declined under President Trump. Uh, there are a variety of warning signs that experts have identified. The precise thing that you focus on does, depends on the person asked. So that being that said, I think it's important to mention that the US is still a democracy. And if you were to look at the two big predictors of uh, democratic collapse, you would think that the US is actually in pretty good shape. So research shows that the, the two big things that help protect a democracy are a long history of democratic rule, and the US has been a democracy for a long time and also levels of development. So rich countries that have been de democratic for a long time have a lower risk of breakdown, according to research. So the US hits both of those bars, which should uh, give us some protection. That said, the baseline risk of transition to dictatorship is elevated. It's higher than it has been in the past. Um, so why do we say this? Well, some would emphasize issues happening with the judiciary. So I like to see the judicial branch filled with individuals who have the credentials to have that position. And we would like to see judicial decisions based on, uh, not based on loyalty to the executive. And instead there have been a number of instances where the judicial branch seems to be favoring uh, the executive rather than going, going on um, the law. And that's come out from a number of constitutioners who have identified these things. That's certainly not my wheelhouse. The other troubling area has been the uh, dismissal of experts and expert insight 
um, the staffing of key political posts with loyalists as opposed to individuals that have the skill set to um, to serve in that capacity, the uh, demonization of the traditional media, which we like to see as kind of the fourth branch of government that could provide a check. So there's a lot of little things that accumulate to a deterioration in the quality of uh, democracy here. The upcoming election is going to be a big uh, test for, <laughs> for the US. Um, when I would countries in terms of whether they're authoritarian or not, the, the focal point is really on whether citizen, citizens have a say in their leadership. And if we see a free and fair race, then American democracy should be good to go. Um, I can expand on that later if you'd like. Okay, great. Yeah, I think, I think you've answered quite a few questions that popped up in here in the chat about um, the state of the US in terms of authoritarianism. Um, so I will skip those, but if anyone who submitted one of those questions feels like theirs wasn't answered, please let me know in the chat. Um, let's go to um, Bill who asked, um, could you please comment on the possibility that governors in some states will appoint slates of electors not pledged to the winner of the state's popular vote? <clears throat> I am not a specialist on the American <laughs> political system. <laughs> so I uh, answer, uh, I can't respond to some of those nuances. Um, that said, if we see departures from norms of behavior that we've had for many years here, that would be troubling. And, you know, I say this a lot, but it is one thing to have rules in place that are democratic in terms of, you know, what they say. Okay, so let's say you have a constitution that says the leader is supposed to be selected, it's going to be free and fair. It's another thing whether these institutions are, are upheld. And what we see historically is that the key thing is norms of behavior. If we have certain norms of behavior, are those norms respected? Our democratic institutions are only as strong as our uh, politicians and citizens will to uphold, uphold these norms of behavior. So if we see this type of um, fishy act happening, that is certainly troubling. And then relatedly, I mentioned this in the talk, but the, we often like to uh, look to the opponents of the leader as the focal point for where we might see some sort of concerted effort to push back against undemocratic actions. But really, we need to be zooming in on the supporters of the leader. It is incumbent on the supporters of the leader to call out undemocratic actions and to do something about it, even though it might not be in their policy interest. And as I mentioned before, when you're so fearful of somebody whose policies you really don't like coming, coming uh, into power, you're more likely to accept undemocratic actions. So we, in the case of the US, the focal point really should be on the Republican Party and um, key actors in the judiciary and in the military um, apparatus. Uh, there have been a number of good developments for democracy where um, at least when there were calls to, um, when Trump called the military to mobilize against protesters, members of the traditional military establishment pushed back. Likewise, when Trump questioned whether he would uh, actually accept the result recently, I think it was in the last uh, week, there were a number of uh, Republicans who said that that wouldn't be the case. So I see those as positive developments. Okay, great. Yes. And I think that kind of also speaks to um, a few other questions that I see in here about um, just elaborating more on that concept of um, people on the supporter of the authoritarian side standing up for um, democracy and standing up to this like authoritarian leader. Um, so let's see, I would like to go to a question from James who asks, on a one to 10 continuum where a 10 equals total control, where does Putin's rule in Russia land? Putin has full control over Russia. <laughs> um, <laughs> in that I would classify him as a personalist dictator. Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by control, but in terms of a strong man, this is certainly a strong man ruler. Uh, just because he has full control does not mean that he's not vulnerable to overthrow. And there are a lot of indicators, according to Russian observers, that Putin's uh, resilience might be cracking. And part of this is at least because of the weakening economic prospects for many people, 
as well as some more blatant uh, incidences of undemocratic actions that have been troubling. So, you know, it, it doesn't help when you have major opposition leaders poisoned in a very public ma manner like happened recently. So he's synonymous with the dictatorship in Russia. I mean, this is one man rule at its finest, but there are some indicators that his uh, ability to assert control is weakening. Okay, great. Um, so a question from Amir, which I'm not quite sure that I completely understand, but what I think he's asking is, um, how do you see like the support of Trump um, in terms of an authoritarian leader or authoritarian characteristics, um, ignoring, so he's asking about the revolution in Sudan, which is seeking democracy, but just in general of Trump's resistance to supporting democratic movements worldwide. Okay, I'm gonna do a two-part answer to that. Um, so the revolution in Sudan was very disappointing for advocates of democracy because the uh, remnants of the old guard still have positions of power. And yes, it's great that we saw the leadership kicked out, but we are still not seeing democracy there, which is you know, a blow for all those uh, citizens who protested for so long against what was an absolutely terrible regime. Unfortunately, about half of the time that dictatorships collapse, we see a regime emerge in its place rather than democracy. And it looks to be the case that that is what's occurring in Sudan. Um, I think in terms of the discussion of Trump, what, what the question might have been getting at is like whether greater US support for democracy in Sudan could have been influential. There is quite a bit of consensus that under Trump, U.S. support for democracies elsewhere has declined. And instead, we've seen quite a bit of buddying up uh, with authoritarian leaders where Trump has been loath to criticize their, um, human rights issues, disrespect for democratic norms, and so forth. Now, I can't say for certain whether, if, whether Trump's support for democracy actually made the difference. That said, in general, when the international community can be on the same page and align with democratic norms, it certainly can be helpful. And we see that this is the case when it comes to coups in that there's some evidence that the risk of having your foreign aid withdrawn should you stage a coup has actually been influential in decreasing the incidence of coups. That's interesting. Okay, um, and then we have a question from Bill again. Um, do you know what research is showing about when pro-democracy movements can succeed after a personalist autocrat has seized power? And is re-democratization -democ after a former democracy has collapsed common or rare? Um, so I mentioned that personalist dictatorships often are the least likely to democratize. And one of the reasons for this is that their leaders often hold on to power until the very end. So their departures are bloody and violent. Why do they hold on to power for the very end till the very end? One reason is that they have made so many enemies that they know that the likelihood that they will have a safe exit is low. And another reason is that they simply don't have access to good information about the citizen pulse. So they stay on, their departures are bloody, and as a result, we see new dictatorships form a lot after personalist dictatorships leave power. Now, um, this is actually pretty consequential in terms of understanding the successes of other protest movements. So when protests are violent, they are much more likely to lead to a new dictatorship than when they are peaceful. So peaceful collective action is very, is very important for paving the way to democracy. And unfortunately, we don't have a super great read on the conditions that are more likely to facilitate peaceful protests as opposed to violent ones. But we do know that in terms of, um, you know, advocating for <laughs> democracy, that you're better off if you can keep those protesters committed to nonviolent tactics. That can be stifled by a regime that is using force against protesters. But regardless, you know, you, you have to keep the, keep the pedal on nonviolence. Um, and then the, the second part, I think, was about re-democratization. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I don't actually have data off the top of my head to inform that answer. We are seeing sometimes sh short-lived interludes with uh, autocracy and democracy when the uh, regime very closely mimics democracy. And the example that comes to mind is Sri Lanka, which was a democracy, and then we saw an authoritarianization, and then uh, a reversion back to democracy, although it's kind of on the brink. But I can't speak to larger trends, unfortunately. Okay, great. Um, so we have a few more minutes, and I don't see any new questions yet, so I'm gonna add one of my own. <laughs> Um, so I was wondering if you could um, maybe talk about how, so we see in the news a lot about um, foreign influence, especially in terms of, you know, Russian fake news, disinformation, um, in terms of that affecting the democratic like values and institutions of other countries, where do you see that playing into like your research into the reasons why countries become less democratic. I mean, does that get chalked up to um, internal issues or does that get chalked up to you know, foreign actors um, since it's all so vague, if that makes sense? So that is one area that um, colleagues and I are looking into, specifically the ways in which uh, new technologies are facilitating authoritarianism. And we are particularly interested in whether these technologies are um, paving the way for exporting of the authoritarian model. The two major focal points are obviously China and Russia, where we're seeing major efforts overseas to um, influence citizen opinion, which these things are um, likely to be successful. We don't know yet. We do know, however, that uh, dictatorships that use digital tools are more long lasting than those that don't and more likely to and less likely to see protests. So these disinformation campaigns, um, the use of bots and trolls to promote the government agenda, they all the evidence suggests that they are successful in autocracies at prolonging authoritarian rule, as opposed to the kind of optimism that we had at the around the time of the Arab Spring that new technologies were going to lead to more democracy, we're actually seeing the opposite. It's very interesting. Okay. All right. Well, unless you have any um, closing remarks, that looks like we that's all we've got. So we'll go ahead and close it out. Um, so thank you very much, Erica, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I found it very informative and I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, once again, I would like to thank our sponsors, supporters, and our interns for helping make this a uh, success. And Erica, as a small token of our appreciation, we would like to virtually present you with the very coveted <laughs> Iowa City Foreign Relations book. <laughs> so thank you again for joining us. I love it, and so I'm very excited to see it. And I <laughs> look forward to one day drinking coffee out of that yes. book. Thank you we'll so much to, for having me. Absolutely. We'll have to mail you the mug so you can do that. All right, great. Thank All you, right. everyone. We're adjourned for the day. Take care.